been uh, many goddesses in Europe and Central Asia who also rode a lion. The, there's a Greek goddess. Uh, we have a similar goddess in Mesopotamia. In various places of the Middle East and Central Asia. You see, the lion has been always uh, associated with some sort of a powerful creature. And the female, we had a long phase of mother worship, mother goddess worship. So when the two of them were combined, it was a double strength. But then uh, Durga, as you see in uh, present form, is a lot of uh, handiwork, a lot of craftsmanship, a lot of juxtapositions. The fair lady who comes uh, in, in, uh, on a lion is a fairly recent uh, phenomenon. In other words, we don't have any evidence of Durga worship on any grand scale in, uh, let us say, the Mongol Kapos. Uh, it talks of Chundi. So we cover the entire medieval phase of Bengal without seeing Durga worship being done on a large scale. Now, the lion is not a native of Bengal or Eastern India, so they hadn't seen, our craftsmen hadn't seen a lion. In fact, the first time they saw a lion would be early 20th century. The Calcutta Zoo opened in 1880. Again, we have no record of lions coming in in the first stage. Even if they came in, by the time the people of Calcutta got acquainted with the lion, so to say, it would be late 19th or early 20th. So, before, between the 17th century and the late 19th, that's 200 years, the lion was just visualized. You, you go around and see the Patochitras, you see the old, uh, old images of Durga, and the lion looks like everything. It looks like a horse, it looks like a mole, it looks like a donkey, because they haven't seen the lion. Sometimes it looks like a tiger. So the real visualization of more or less accurately of a lion would be done only in the early 20th century. The Zamindas, Zamindari class came up in Bengal in, uh, in the just in the pre-colonial phase in the early 17th. There have been a few Hindu tax collectors here and there but that's not the point. The question is of, that, of getting almost semi-sovereign powers. But it is actually the second phase of Hindu Zamindari power that is post Plassey, post 1757, 1760 and that's the time when you see Mahaprishna Dev, they were basically merchants for the company, they were basically clerical staff of the company, interlocutors, traders on behalf of the company who were suddenly endowed with a lot of uh, land status, landed status and they wanted to consolidate their status into into social power by a display of pomp and power, ritual. That's a time they wanted to overawe, if I may use the term, because their rise was not looked upon very kindly. Their proximity to the British was uh, condemned by many upper caste and even lower caste Hindus. So they wanted to offset the whole thing by a show of grandeur. Uh, one example, as I said, Namakrishna Dev. So he even invited the British in a display of uh, Malhami, as if that I have the power to call the Lak Sahab to my house. That is the time when uh, when Durga actually takes off. All public religious festivals all over the world have a large component of money rolling in, sponsorship, uh, service, uh, employment. Uh, employment in ancillary industries from making making all sorts of components, so if I may use the term, from the image to the uh, Shamiana Pandal to lights to decoration. So all sorts of things come in and uh, it has reached quite a mature stage. Bapir Bari is the concept that sold in Bengal unlike the warrior Durga in the rest of the country. Bengal's Uma with her children is perhaps different from the Durga of the rest of India. It just doesn't explain how the so-called sons and daughters are looking away when the mother is fighting a desperate battle. Kartik is supposed to be the warrior of the gods. He's just disinterested twirling his moustache. 
uh, Ganesh is looking uh, happy at the food. Saraswati, as you know, was uh, Brahma's daughter and uh, her adoption by Durga was not, uh, was not legally certified. So all these things happened. The children were brought in and Bengal is the only state where you have Durga coming in with Shakuribar, children. That was one more Zamindari Brahmanical instrument to cool down the Ranarongini, cool down this tempestuous woman by saying, while we do worship your power, while we do admire your power of femininity, it goes with an obligation, pipe down, look at the children. It was a feminization, it was a gender domination of Durga. Radio was not gelling in the early stages. So they got together in this think tank of very great persons at that point of time. Pani Kumar, Rajat Boral, um, Birindra Krishna Bhadro, Jogesh Bosch, they were all together. And they came up with this idea that maybe uh, this part would be of uh, would be of assistance over radio. It caught on very fast. Until about 1963, the radio station was up all night. The act, the the participants, the musicians would be parked there all night because it was live. Live. You had the Muslim mm. musicians along with a non-Brahman uh, reciter. In fact, this question was raised. Virendra Krishna Bhatra is not a Brahman. Can he, uh, does he have the legitimacy to, to read out a sacred prayer? As we move along, we invent tradition and then telescope it back to time on imagining that this particular event or item or ritual or tradition is eternal. It gives us a lot of satisfaction.